Joseph Stalin, one of the most feared men of the 20th century, both by his enemies and his own citizens, many of which he in fact considered his enemies, responsible for sequestering off large parts of Europe under the Iron Curtain and for fueling fears of international nuclear war. Just how did this man come to be one of the most notorious figures in history? Born in 1878 as Joseph Vissarionovich Zukashvili, Stalin grew up an only child and son of a poor peasant family. His father was a shoemaker and an alcoholic who vented his frustrations out on his son with regular beatings, and his mother was a laundress, doing laundry for others to earn enough for the family to survive. Contracting smallpox as a child, Stalin would be disfigured for life with Ah, he was working class. The the makings of a dictator, the origins of a dictator. His father was but a shoemaker. He could never run a government like the son of a capitalist, like George Bush, the grandson of corporate shareholder who helped Adolf Hitler rise to power. Those are the only people who can run governments. I also love how they say Stalin sequestered a huge portion of Europe as, as if communism wasn't a specter haunting Europe and as if there weren't, you know, tons of working class communist uprisings as if it was just all Stalin, you know, was somehow able to just take over all these countries um, and rule them with an iron fist. His signature facial scars, which only added to his tough exterior demeanor. Surprisingly, Stalin earned a scholarship as a teen to a seminary school in Tbilisi, where he began to study for the priesthood in the Georgian Orthodox Church. However, while in seminary, Stalin began to secretly read German social Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Influenced by the social, economic, and political turmoil of 19th century Europe, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote the infamous Manifesto in response to the persecution and exploitation of the communists. Again, I went over this in one of the last bourgeois propaganda ridiculous videos that we watched. Why do they always isolate the manifesto? I mean, I know they do it because it's a good way to take Marx out of context, right? It's a good way to isolate this, excuse me, 35 page or so um, party pamphlet for the Communist Party um, created by Marx in the 1800s and say that this is the entire philosophy of Marxism. This is, you know, everything he wrote um, and this is everything that he thought was true about the world. Um, when in fact, you know, there's thousands more pages um, and thousands more pages of um, intense, in-depth economic analysis, whereas the manifesto basically just summarizes um, Marxist theory, uh, class struggle and the struggle for socialism, and then encourages the workers to take over the government, like pumps them up. Like I said, it's a party program. Um, but all of these videos, they isolate the manifesto as if it's um, the, the core central work um, of Marxist theory, or as if it's some Bible, something that Marxists hold up dogmatically like a holy book. Um, it just is not accurate. That's not what it is historically. That's not what it is in the context of the broader works of Marxist literature, both by Marx itself, himself and the ones who would come later. You know, it's not a foundational piece of theory. Like I said, it's a party program. It's a workers pump up mixtape. Um, and it's a, a very concise summary of Marxist theory. Common men by the bourgeoisie who benefited greatly off the hard labor of the proletariat, whose only real wealth and power was their labor. Marx and Engels called for the proletariat to unify and use their only asset, the labor the bourgeoisie exploited overwhelmingly for their own gain, to barter for more equitable employment terms. A teenage Stalin was immediately hooked on Marx and Engels' words and became interested in the revolutionary movement against the Russian monarchy, which treated its citizens as serfs who held few, if any, rights. In 1889, Stalin was expelled from his seminary for missing his exams, but he would go on later to claim that his expulsion was for the discovery of what was deemed Marxist propaganda. Whatever the real reason, Stalin's expulsion set him on a collision course with history. And perhaps if a group of freeze had been a bit more tolerant, then history and Russia itself would have been spared untold catastrophes to come. Immediately upon his expulsion, Stalin dove headfirst into political activism, becoming an underground political agitator. And take so here's where they individualize it. Um, earlier, they were talking about how Stalin is working class and son of the shoe or son of a shoemaker um, who was maybe too harsh on him or, or who abused him um, physically. And that's what turned him into the leader he was. But, you know, childhood trauma definitely does have effects on people. Um, but to act like that's the reason, you know, Russia turned out the way it did. Um, I mean, Stalin was a very tough leader, right? Um, he, he was in, an iron willed leader who made decisions and stuck with them and followed them through, um, and, and did what he thought was right for the construction of socialism. Um, so, you know, his upbringing may have been what crafted his personality and what made him tough. But it's the material conditions, the class conditions in Russia um, that allowed for the revolution to happen. You know, the um, development of capitalism that was happening at the time, the dictatorship of the monarchy, the czars, um, the 
Russian workers, the Russian troops and soldiers who were constantly being sent to fight and die in these wars for imperialism as capitalism developed into its imperialist stage. This is what allowed um, Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky and whoever else um, to form this revolutionary movement, lead this revolutionary movement in Russia that overthrew the monarchy and overthrew feudalism. Um, more so than Stalin just being iron willed. I mean, the material conditions crafted the individuals like Stalin, um, but it's that those material conditions that created the situation, um, not the individualized personalities of the leaders at the time, um, which is what Western liberal historians and economists and um, political analysts always try and do. They always try and individualize history. This great man of history fallacy, as we call it. Taking part in labor demonstrations and work strikes. At this time, he adopted the name of Kova after a fictional Robin Hood-like Georgian outlaw hero and became a prominent member of the Marxist social democratic movement's more militant chapter, the Bolsheviks. At the time, the Bolsheviks were being led by Vladimir Lenin, whom Stalin would immediately idolize for his fiery passion and determination to set Russia's workers free. Stalin eagerly shared in Lenin's dreams of a Russia free of the greed and corruption of capitalism whose workers shared equitably in the profits of their labor. In order to fund this revolutionary movement, however, Stalin became involved in various criminal enterprises to include bank heists, the proceeds of which all went to fund the Bolshevik party. In 1906, Stalin married Ekaterina Petos Vanitsa, though Tragically, she would go on to die a year later, shortly after the birth of Stalin's son, Yakov, from typhus. Yakov himself would meet a similarly tragic fate, dying during World War II as a prisoner in Germany. In 1912, Lenin, who was in exile in Switzerland, appointed Stalin to serve on the first Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, securing Stalin's first true grip on power in what would be the future Communist Party of the Soviet Union. A year later, Stalin was arrested and exiled to Siberia, but in 1917, revolution swept across Russia in what would become the known as the Russian Revolution, with Stalin playing a prominent role. A vote of the Bolshevik Central Committee of 10 to 2 prompted the Bolsheviks to start planning an armed insurrection. After Lenin told committee members that revolution was inevitable, what followed was a at least they admit that the czarist monarchy and the era of feudalism in Russia was authoritarian um, or dictatorial and imprisoned Stalin and exiled Lenin. Um, and they mentioned that the people under this regime had almost no rights, which is what led to the revolution. Some people like do apologetics for the czar, at, um, the, the monarchy and feudalism when they talk about the Russian revolution. Like as if industrializing the country and moving them away from feudalism wasn't a progressive step forward, um, which is hilarious even for pro-capitalist or bourgeois economists to say because they should support the move away from feudalism, but whatever would see the ruling czar and his family ousted from power and then executed, with Lenin leading the way in creating the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic, the first self-proclaimed socialist state, seen by Lenin as a tough character who could get things done behind the scenes, or in plain speak, a thug who wasn't afraid to kill political enemies or commit atrocities in the name of the cause. Lenin appointed Stalin to a prominent position during the Red Army's invasion of Georgia, where he got the reputation for being specially brutal against any opposition. Eventually, with the Bolshevik Party's expansion of power, it became necessary to expand the scope for the Central Committee, and at the 11th Congress, the position of Secretariat of the Central Committee was formed, to which Lenin appointed Stalin on the 3rd of April, 1922. From then on, until his death, Stalin would always be known as. At least they don't try and say that uh, Stalin, I mean, sorry, Lenin wanted Trotsky to take over. And then Stalin seized leadership um, from Trotsky, the rightful leader of the Soviet Union, who would have, you know, made everything work out perfectly um, and made it so the Soviet Union never collapsed. Um, that's a myth that we hear in the West a lot that I guess didn't make it into this video. General Secretary, though the position was never intended to be as powerful or dictatorial as Stalin would make it into. Briefly disappointed with his appointment after not being given a heavy ministerial post and seeing the early iteration of the General Secretary as a relatively weak political position, Stalin quit. That's actually interesting that they say he made it more dictatorial than it was originally supposed to be because production did become more centralized. Uh, it was more decentralized and there were more markets allowed. It was less top down. It was less planned. Um, there was less central economic planning. Um, but with the German buildup of their forces, which would later lead to World War II um, and the invasion of the Soviet Union as Germany tried to take over the world, um, what we call the rise of fascism, um, there was a need for the Soviet Union to quickly industrialize and quickly build up their military in order to defend themselves. Um, so the only way that this could be done was with more top-down central economic planning. Um, you couldn't have that much market activity going on um, or uh, that much decentralization of production because they needed to, to you know, um, focus production on military spending. Otherwise, they were going to be destroyed. And, and every Western analyst at the time was saying that the Soviet Union would be destroyed, that Germany would capture the Soviet Union. And then it was a matter of what do we do after this? Um, but the Soviet Union losing 20 million approximately, you know, or so probably more um, 
soldiers and citizens in doing so beat back the German army, uh, took 80% of the casualties in World War II and, and saved the world from fascism, largely as a result of that central economic planning, um, which is always conflated with Stalin turning the country into a dictatorship. Quickly learned how to use the new office to influence and gain advantage over other key persons within the Bolshevik party. Eventually, Stalin would grow the power of the office, taking it far outside the scope that Lenin or any of the party's members had ever envisioned for it. A few weeks after Stalin's appointment, Lenin suffered a stroke and was forced into semi-retirement. Initially fully supportive of Stalin as general secretary, Lenin's support would eventually wane when he learned of Stalin's brutality against political opponents, abuse of power, and growing internal party struggles. A report from the invasion in Georgia of violent atrocities committed in the... Oh, there we go. There's the Trotskyist myth. Um, Lenin had a stroke, but... You know, after he had a stroke and was <laughs> dealing with serious health issues of the brain, he denounced Stalin um, for being evil. Um, yeah, watch our interview with Grover Fur if you want to get more in depth um, with the the false testament um, from Lenin uh, or the fabrication of Lenin's accusation against Stalin or claim that Stalin was a dictator. In the name of the party by supporters of Stalin also soured Lenin's view on this one-time protege. Knowing that his death was imminent, Lenin drafted a political will between December 1922 and January 1923, containing some harsh criticisms of Stalin and fear of the fragmentation of the Bolshevik party. Lenin would go on to die in 1924, throwing the Bolsheviks into disarray and a struggle for power. Stalin, however, took advantage of his position as general secretary to fan the flames of antagonism between political rivals. Oh my gosh, they're turning him into Rick Moranis from Spaceballs. Lone Star. Yes, it's me. I'm here to save my girlfriend. Hi, honey. No, you are going to die. Oh, oh, oh. Darth Helmet? I don't know. Never mind. Hopefully some people know what I'm talking about. Took advantage of his position as general secretary to fan the flames of antagonism between political rivals. Stalin had his eye on power the whole time, but his greatest enemy would be Leon Trotsky, a prominent member of the party who was the creator of the Soviet Union's Red Army and was widely considered as intellectually superior to Stalin and a better orator. Stalin, however, would pit the other members of the party against Trotsky, cleverly keeping himself out of Trotsky's direct line of fire and coming off as a mediator. Ultimately, though, the failure of socialist revolutions across Europe led to Stalin's idea of socialism in one country, wherein the Soviet Union should focus on strengthening itself, being preferred over Trotsky's permanent revolution, wherein the revolution should be exported to non-socialist nations because the Soviet Union would never survive alone in a capitalist world when revolutions across Europe failed and it became Stalin believed in exporting revolution. He believed in global revolution. He just believed in, you know, making one country a stronghold of socialism, developing a worker state and socialism in one country, even, you know, if that didn't uh, mean all the surrounding countries also had to be socialist too, you know, in, in order for that to be done. That could be done in one country. Um, the workers could control the state and the government um, without, you know, the entire world um, transitioning to socialism at a similar time. Global revolution or um, what's this is known as Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. And, you know, a lot of times it makes it seem like Stalin didn't believe in, you know, global revolution when really the Soviet Union was funding and supporting every revolutionary socialist movement around the world. You know, this is what now, sometimes uh, ultras or, um, you know, sometimes honestly can be rightfully criticized as Soviet social imperialism, I guess. Um, actually, I don't know how I feel about that, um, the theory of social imperialism. A lot of times it's just nonsense. Um, but, you know, there's a, a Marxist theory and idea that the, the Soviet Union was so involved in funding revolutionary movements around the world um, that it, you know, could have been called imperialism. So it's not that Stalin was against uh, supporting global revolutionary movements. Um, but Trotsky was saying things like uh, the Soviet Union shouldn't go to the aid of France against the Nazis because France is capitalist too, right? And we should only defend socialist countries. Um, whereas the Stalin would write socialism and or Marxism in the national question. And so the Soviet Union would take the position of defending right to national self-determination, right? Defending the anti-colonial movements in the global South, um, defending the sovereignty and the right of the people in any country to choose their own destiny, you know, believing that eventually the development of production and class struggle will lead to um, socialism. Um, now, Venezuela in many ways has kind of embraced Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. Um, there are aspects of it that I do think are useful and correct, but uh, most of them, I think, are things that Lenin wouldn't reject. You know, I'm sorry, that Stalin wouldn't reject. Um, most of the aspects of Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, I think, um, Stalin accepted. Because like I said, he, he was trying to, to spread global revolution. Um, he just wanted to develop socialism in one country while um, he did it. 
where, you know, and that's where Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution starts to get like, there's a lot of gray area there too. And you don't know exactly what he's saying. Like, so what is the theory of permanent revolution? If you don't believe in socialism in one country, does that mean the socialist country should start going to war with any capitalist nation who doesn't embrace socialism? Should they, you know, fully embrace like a real form of socialist or communist imperialism where they try and impose it on the rest of the world? And, you know, how do you consolidate support from the people to do that? You know, the people in Russia largely went towards socialism and supported the revolution because they were tired of fighting in imperialist wars. They were tired of uh, fighting um, wars for capitalist expansion. Um, and there was a mutiny in the military um, and they sided with the revolutionaries. Um, so, yeah, I don't think constant warfare and socialist imperialism is the way to go. But, um, and I, you know, not that that's what Trotsky's saying, but sometimes I don't really know what Trotsky's saying when I read the theory of permanent revolution. Obvious that they would never succeed, Trotsky's fate was sealed, and he was removed from power and eventually expelled from the Communist Party and exiled to Kazakhstan. Having allied with Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev to oust Trotsky and other rivals, Stalin desired to oust his two former companions, and thus began to court the far-right elements of the Bolshevik Party, eventually ensuring that his former allies would be sent to the Gulag. Stalin then turned on his second set of allies and ousted them as well, leaving Joseph Stalin as the sole autocratic ruler of the entire Soviet Union. Up until this point, Stalin had not yet thought about outright killing his political opponents, but that and a great deal of things would quickly change. With the reins of the Soviet Union firmly in his grasp, Joseph Vizarionovich Yukash changed his name to Joseph Stalin, meaning Man of Steel. Yet Stalin had taken leadership of a troubled nation. Economically and industrially, the Soviet Union lagged behind the rest of European powers, and poor management of crops was leading to a pending famine. 19 Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The Soviet Union industrialized faster than any other country in human history at the time, which would later be surpassed by China, and that's it. It's still the second fastest development of industrialization and increase in living standards that's ever been seen in human history, right? This is obvious. This is like what Richard Wolff explained to Destiny, the streamer in that debate um, about the development of different economies um, in the 20th century. The Soviet Union was blowing expectations out of the water. Like I said, every analyst expected them, every Western analyst expected them to get mopped up um, by the, the German forces, but they didn't because the speed at which they were able to industrialize. Um, illiteracy went from like 17, er, literacy, sorry, went from like 17% to 99% in a matter of years as they educated all their people. Um, uh, electricity and access to power, infrastructure, plumbing, um, malnutrition was greatly decreased poverty was greatly decreased all these things happened as they industrialized and they were able to industrialize while under western sanctions and economic warfare um and without you know the help of slavery in this giant cotton market which fueled uh, industrialization and the rise of capitalism in england and the northern united states um so it was a much more humane and efficient and speedy process of industrialization compared to that which was undergone under capitalism right and agriculture similarly there's a reason why after the revolution and after the early years of industrialization and collectivization there aren't any more famines in the soviet union right there are weather conditions and um uh, various factors that lead to famines in the early years of the Soviet Union as they're trying to industrialize agriculture and move towards machine agriculture and this process of collectivization. Um, and, you know, there are people who die in famines, but as with every socialist country, the famines that happen early on in the revolution are the last famines that the country ever experiences because they do enact machine agriculture. They do produce um, an incredible amount of infrastructure, an incredible amount of tractors um, and, and other things that allow for uh, the mass production of crops that was never capable or that um, the country was never capable of under the feudal economy, um, under the monarchic um, dictatorial feudal system controlled by landlords that they had previously. You know, and maybe that's what they mean by Russia lagging behind in infrastructure uh, maybe they're talking about the the feudal or semi-feudal system that Russia had, which was um, far less developed, far less industrialized, far less capitalistic than the system in Europe, um, in, in Western Europe, at least um, in Britain and the United States. Um, but they would quickly industrialize and take over the rest of the world in a way that scared the crap out of the West um, and really showed the effectiveness of socialism and socialist planning. And 
they, they're talking a whole lot about Trotsky. If you read Trotsky, he says this, right? He says this loud and clear. He says, yes, the Soviet Union has, you know, taught everyone to read. Yes, the Soviet Union has electrified the country. Yes, the Soviet Union has industrialized agriculture so we can feed everyone. Yes, the Soviet Union produces far more tractors um, and agricultural infrastructure than the capitalist world. But, you know, Stalin's a dictator and the political system is messed up. And here's what I want to change. Right. But they only take the parts of Trotsky that they like that feed this imperialist mainstream bourgeois narrative. 27 had produced only 70 percent of the grain that 1926 had yielded. The signs were clear. Radical change was needed and needed immediately. Unfortunately for the citizens of the Soviet Union, that change would come in the wrong form. Blaming the kulaks, affluent peasants and the netmen, small business owners for the poor economic state of affairs. Stalin traveled to Novosibirsk and claimed that the kulaks. I love how they blame Stalin by saying that he just hoarded all the grain. He just took a giant spoon and ate all the grain. When there were literally wealthy um, affluent farmers, right, um, the, the highest class of peasants who owned, you know, huge swaths of land, the kulaks, um, who a lot of the, the lower class peasants worked under, who were literally hoarding the grain, right, who were literally trying to prevent their land from being taken um, by hoarding the, the, the product um, that they were in control of because of their ownership of the means of production. Um, and it caused people to die. Um, it exacerbated the famine caused by weather conditions and other factors in the state. And Stalin had to intervene, right, to try and get people fed, to try and end this famine, to try and stop the hoarding of grain. Um, but then they just invert it, right? They they project whatever the capitalists were doing onto the socialists and claim it was the socialist fault. It wasn't the kulaks, the wealthy farmers who controlled the means of production that create grain hoarding the grain, even though that makes perfect sense that they would do that. It was Stalin doing it just because he's so evil and he just hates the people of Ukraine so much. Um, and, you know, he wants people to starve under this economic system. Like if he supports socialism, why would he want to purposefully starve millions of people that makes socialism look terrible? Um, but he just did it because he was so evil and he was so bitter towards the people of Ukraine. Um, just like Putin. Putin is probably Stalin's grandson. Kulaks were hoarding grain for themselves and ordered the Kulaks be arrested and their grain confiscated, which Stalin promptly brought back with him to Moscow. Having tested the limits of his power and finding no significant blowback to his cruel actions, Stalin immediately ordered the creation of grain procurement squads across much of the... The Kulaks were hoarding grain. And Stalin said, you think you can hoard grain? Watch this. And he arrested them all pulling out his giant ice cream scooper and eating all their grain in front of them. There was then a famine because Stalin ate enough grain to feed 3 million people. Growing regions of Soviet Union and violence immediately broke out between these government thieves and the peasants defending their rightfully grown and earned grain. Some of the Central Committee members were horrified at these measures, but in January 1930, the Politburo approved the liquidation of the entire Kulak class. Accused Kulaks were rounded up and exiled or thrown into gulags, with many dying on their way to the prison camps. At about that same time, Stalin initiated the policy of mass collectivization of agriculture, which set up collective farms made up of formerly privately owned property. Peasants reluctantly joined these collective farms for fear of suffering the same fate as the Kulaks due to the resentment at the loss of their. I love how. You know, the bourgeois ideologues, the capitalist ideologues, like Stalin was evil, right? He was taking these people, these capitalists who were hoarding grain and starving people, creating famines on purpose to try and hoard wealth and accumulate more wealth. And he was arresting them and he was stopping them from doing that. How evil of him. Like, <laughs> you can see they're terrified. Um, of any kind of authority being used to put power and to put economic power um, and control the means of production in the hands of the working class and take it out of the hands of the ruling capitalist class, um, even if that ruling capitalist class is starving people um, and acting as authoritarian as they possibly could. Like today, you know, who are the kulaks? We don't have wealthy peasants. Um, agriculture is largely controlled by shareholders like Bill Gates. Like I said, finance capitalists, speculation, um, people who uh, specialize in speculation and manipulating stocks. And Bill Gates uses his charities and his NGOs um, that he donates to to get tax write offs um, to control agriculture in places like Africa. Um, and I wrote an article about that recently, actually, um, which you can check out at called Bill Gates failed effort to feed Africa. Was he even trying to help in the first place? Spoiler alert, he was not even trying to help in the first place. He was trying to control African agriculture 
um, and keep wages and production costs as low as possible. Um, and he ended up poisoning their soil using fertilizer, Western fertilizer that wasn't meant for the African soil. Um, and also turning their soil monocropic as imperialist agriculture often does. Um, and, and Africa had a summit, a bunch of African agricultural experts had a summit to say, hey, Bill Gates, you poisoned um, our soil. You, none of your promises have come true. And this so-called green revolution, this green agricultural revolution that Bill Gates and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation launched in Africa um, has been a failure. It's been a method to poison the soil um, sell a bunch of Western fertilizer from Western fertilizer companies, which guess what? Bill Gates owns, um, owns large majority shares in and, you know, control the agriculture in Africa to, to make more money from, from that product as well. Um, so really this charity has been a scam. Um, and if the workers were to come to power, if a socialist government were to come to power, of course, of course we should use the government to stop this. We should use the government to seize Bill Gates's assets um, and investigate what he's doing. Um, but that is what the bourgeois ideologues would decry as authoritarian. You know, you're acting as a dictator um, because using the authority um, in the interests of the working masses is what the capitalist ruling class bourgeois ideologues call authoritarianism or totalitarianism. Um, and that's what Stalin did with the kulaks privately owned land and low morale. Productivity plummeted and famines broke out. Large armed upswings arose throughout the Soviet Union, which were brutally put down by the Red Army, which killed almost as many of its own citizens as the Nazis would a decade later. Opposition to Stalin and his brutal policies arose from... Both sides, both sides, both sides. Communism and fascism are the same, even though the liberals collaborated with the fascists and corporations collaborated with the fascists and the communists are the ones who beat them in the Politburo, but these opponents were in the minority and quickly removed from power. Stalin claimed to be building the communist utopia he dreamed of as a youth, replacing exploitative capitalist practices with equality and granting workers a fair share of the prosperity they generate. All right, folks, I got to be done with this. I can't do it anymore. They call they said communism is when you build a utopia and Stalin thought he was building a utopia. And you know my rule. My rule is if they call socialism or Marxism utopian, I jump out my window. Just kidding, but I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. Ingalls wrote a whole pamphlet for you guys called Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. He wrote a whole pamphlet just criticizing the utopians and talking about how utopian socialism is not the way, how we need scientific socialism. We must build socialism slowly, construct it out of capitalism. And the birthmarks of the old mode of production always make themselves felt and can be seen in the new mode of production. So therefore, you know, we need to take this system of capitalism and build socialism out of it, transform socialism out of it, sublate capitalism, turn it into socialism slowly but surely. Not just create this utopian society overnight. And in fact, there never is going to be a utopian society. There's no such thing. There will always be contradictions and humans will always be mortal. Right? And there will always be things that make us sad. Um, but we can control production. Um, we can have democracy in production, just like liberalism claims to have democracy in the political system. Um, and we can make society and life better. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say Bill Gates responded to um, the summit in Africa criticizing his agricultural policies by saying, yes, the Green Revolution has failed. I acknowledge that it's been a complete failure and has reached none of its goals. Um, and the answer to this is to sell more fertilizer. Um, and then he invested millions more dollars in continuing the Green Revolution, uh, but changed its name, changed what it was called. Um, so doing the exact same thing, even after there was a summit in Africa requesting that he didn't. Um, and one of the most interesting parts about that article, which I hope I sent to you all, um, I did, yes. Um, one of the most interesting parts about that article is after the summit, um, which was not covered anywhere in Western media other than like a short article in the Seattle Times, uh, like this local newspaper in Seattle um, who covered this summit of African agricultural experts who called for an end to Bill Gates's um, charity scam. Um, which is actually a way to exploit Africa that's led to the poisoning of their soil by Western fertilizer.
the only article that was published by it was an article that actually didn't even mention it, didn't even um, mention the summit other than the Seattle Times article I mentioned. Um, there was an article published a few days later by um, a few days after the summit. Hold on, let me go to my sources. Oh, yeah, it was the New York Times. Okay, so we there was this article in the Seattle Times covering the summit in Africa. Other than that, it really wasn't covered anywhere in Western media. And then a few days after the summit, there was this piece from the New York Times, which didn't even mention it, right? Didn't even mention that there was a summit in Africa criticizing Bill Gates and the Green Revolution. But Bill Gates acknowledged a lot of the criticisms that were made in that summit. Right. So it's clear that he knew the summit happened. He knew that agricultural experts in Africa came together to criticize, you know, what his Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was doing and how it was just manipulating things for the benefit of companies that Bill Gates owned shares in and for his own profit. Um, but it doesn't mention that the summit, act summit actually happened. So he says, yes, you know, I know the Green Revolution failed to meet all its goals. I know that we're in a worse place than I expected. I know that, you know, the fertilizer has damaged the African soil, but we actually need to invest more money and sell them more fertilizer. This was his takeaway. <laughs> so they take the summit criticizing him, completely ignore it, um, other than, you know, brushing aside some of the criticisms that were made and then come away with the opposite conclusion. Right. Oh, you don't want us to sell you any more fertilizer and manipulate agricultural markets using philanthropy. Uh, well, we're going to do that way more. And we're going to follow up this article with a multi-million dollar investment in um, expanding Bill Gates's control of African agriculture. So, yeah, I recommend you read this article. Of, if I when I take the time to sit down and write an article and systematize my arguments like this, it's either either something that I've written for class something that I've written for my graduate program um, that I think is really interesting and that I can pretty easily turn into a Midwestern Marx article, or it's something I really care about and that I think is absolutely insane and crazy and that people need to know about and that I want to be able to cite whenever I can or whenever I need to. Um, and this is one of those instances. So yeah, this, this article blew up a bit on, in, uh, sorry, on TikTok. Um, and there were some tweets uh, tweeting out videos of me talking about this article that blew up on Twitter. Um, so some people liked it. But... Mm -hmm.